listening to Harris Smith Radio. I'm your host, Wayne McPhail. In this episode, we go deep into the Canadian beef industry with a young woman who grew up on an Ontario beef farm, consults to the government about Canadian agriculture, is a politician herself, and can convert vegans to meat-eating on social media. Next up, an elegiac and informative meditation on that most prosaic of feeds, hay. Both interviews are food for thought. By the way, if you want to read Harrismith magazine instead of listen to it, you can subscribe to the print version online at harrismithmag.com. And you can find Harrismith magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. But for now, settle in for the next half hour of Harrismith Radio. Amanda Broadhagen has been around beef since birth. She grew up on a cattle farm near Stratford, Ontario. There, she developed a love for her animals and for the rich pasture ecosystem on which they grazed and which they shared with a variety of natural species. Today, Amanda is a proud advocate for the beef industry, an agri-food consultant to the government, and a politician herself. She's a rural councillor in the township of Perth East in Ontario. I spoke with Amanda recently about her life with cattle, the challenges the industry faces, and the need for diversity and innovation if the industry is to survive. Here's our conversation. Hey, Amanda, thanks very much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because you're in an interesting position. You've been a beef farmer since you were a kid. You're a woman in the beef industry. You've grown up on a farm. You are involved in government. You've been involved in consulting with government around the beef industry and agriculture in general. You've seen the industry from sort of nose to tail. So I really want to have a a fun conversation about your life and your experiences in the beef industry. And I want to start off by just talking a little bit about what it was like for you growing up on a beef farm in Ontario. Well, thanks for having me, Wayne. And, you know, my experience growing up on a beef farm in southwestern Ontario, I was really fortunate and was involved in the uh, 4-H program. And that, for those of you uh, listening that aren't familiar with it, is a youth program uh, in Canada, and there's different projects. So I was part of the 4-H beef project and would raise animals and uh, and show them. And that really gave me a great experience in terms of responsibility and learning about animal health and welfare and how to take care of animals. But I never truly appreciated my upbringing until I went away to university and realized that not everybody had, you know, the same experience that I did and had the same incredible opportunity to be able to raise animals and, you know, interact with, uh, with the natural environment. And so I think uh, that really opened my eyes. And uh, certainly it helped that my degree that I chose in university wasn't agriculture. Uh, I, my degree is in political science. So certainly I was exposed to a whole different a group of people with different worldview perspectives. So let's talk about those different perspectives because now, and I, you know, I was thinking it's it's very similar to sort of maybe tobacco farmers back in the 70s and 80s that these days in terms of environmental concerns, in terms of people doing plant-based diets, that there's a bit of a pariah status to beef and beef farmers and stuff, which must grate on you given that you, your, your love for the the business and love for the, the life that you, you have. So, Let's talk a little bit about the environmental impact of beef farming. You know, unfortunately, there has been those negative perceptions out there, but I want to point to something that many of the listeners probably don't know, is that in Canada, uh, the native prairie grasslands in Western Canada is one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. In fact, uh, we only have about 20% of it left. And there's been some great work done in terms of talking about the importance of those lands and the role that, you know, beef cattle can play in terms of maintaining that important ecosystem for those plant species, uh, but also a number of species at risk across in Western Canada. So I think that is something that people perhaps don't know. You know, we think about the rainforest, we think about pollution in our oceans. We don't think about um, this incredible resource that we have right in our backyard. So let's take that apart a bit. You're saying that the prairie lands, the prairie grasslands are really important and that having beef cattle on it preserves that land somehow. Explain that to me. 
grazing cattle actually helps with sequestering carbon. And that is basically the practice of storing carbon from the atmosphere in soils and plants. And so when you don't have grazers on that land, the land actually loses its biodiversity, um, believe it or not. And so we need to have that process uh, just much like when the buffalo um, grazed uh, Western Canadian prairies. Uh, now we need to have cattle uh, to be able to do that. And I think the amazing part about cattle is that they share the natural environment with other species. They don't take away from it. And I think that is the really beautiful thing about um, raising cattle. And certainly I'm giving an example of a Western Canadian experience, but I can also speak to it from, you know, living on a farm in Eastern Canada. When I, one of my favorite things to do is to go on pasture walk. And I love seeing the birds, you know, in the pastures and in particular bobolink birds. These are birds that have lost their habitat over time. And it's great that they've been able to find refuge on my family's farm and, you know, see that, you know, be able to coexist with the natural environment and being able to have my cattle there on my family's cattle there, um, you know, adds to, to the biodiversity on our farm and the, the health of our soils. And uh, also I can feel good about eating beef. So if the cattle weren't there, wouldn't the land still be there? Like what's the, what's the advantage of having the cattle on the land? I think the benefit of having the cattle on the land, I mean, in Western Canada and in certain parts of Ontario, some of these lands are considered marginal lands. So if they weren't utilized, not much else can grow on there. And then also going back to what I had mentioned earlier, if the land, if there's no grazers on that land, whether that's bison, whether that's beef, whether that's sheep or goat, uh, any of those ruminant animals, it actually limits the biodiversity. So um, it just becomes overgrown and it's not fully utilized. And so when a cow is grazing, it encourages encourages that those native plants to uh, to grow and keeps away some of those perhaps invasive and non-native grasses. Okay, so let's go back to the discussion about carbon sequestering because I understand the the idea that if you've got a lot of plant life in the ground, it's it's holding the carbon, it's sequestering the carbon, so you're not getting carbon dioxide released into the air. But the contrary position would be, well, yeah, but then you've got a lot of cows who are creating methane and that is even more detrimental to the environment than the carbon that would be released had the carbon not be sequestered by the pasture lands, right? Right. I think, you know, the public and certain, uh, certainly some policy um, makers sort of fail, what they fail to understand is they sometimes view agriculture, not just necessarily beef cattle, as emitters of greenhouse gases and not talking about um, the role that it, agriculture plays in terms of uh, sequestering carbon. So I think it needs to be a balance. And I think the important thing about when we're talking about going back to cattle um, and grazing cattle is that um, when managed properly, that is the key thing um, when we talk about rotational grazing and those techniques that farmers use to, to manage it. Um, and also soil health. So I'll point to an example of my family's farm. We in southwestern Ontario have very prime land. It's on class one farmland. Uh, so some people might say, well, why are you why are you grazing cattle on class one farmland? Well, we have them as part of our whole system on our farm. So they actually have improved the soil health and, you know, having their manure and the, the, that nutrients in the soil has actually made us have better yields in our crops. And so we feel that having the diversity of the cattle and our crops makes for better yield and also better soil health. And, you know, there's been a lot of research done in terms of soil health and some interesting partnerships where crop farmers that are, you know, grain farmers are working in collaboration with, with uh, beef farmers or other farmers that have ruminant animals because they want their manure or they want them on their land because of the environmental benefits to their soil health. We were able to raise cattle and produce a protein that is highly desirable, not only domestically, but around the world. People desire um, Canadian beef. They look for Canadian beef when they're shopping. And I think it's, you can enjoy a steak or enjoy a burger and feel good about the fact that you're actually, it was produced in a very sustainable way. 
So it reminds me very much of, of conversations I've had with hunters and conservationists that it's kind of counterintuitive, but uh, you know the argument is, and I think it's a strong argument, that in fact hunters are contributing a great deal to the conservation efforts because they're the main ones who are actually contributing dollars to the conservation of land in Canada for uh, wetlands, in the case of Ducks Unlimited Canada, for example. Um, so counterintuitively, they're actually being a benefit to the environment, much in the same way as, as it seems like what you're saying is, is for, for some folks would be a counterintuitive argument that having beef cattle on land, pasture land, is actually a good thing for the environment. Absolutely. And and so we're going back to uh, one of your earlier points. The, the key thing is if that land is left idle, it loses its biodiversity. You need that grazing impact, whether it's beef cattle, whether it's bison or another ruminant animal interacting with, with the environment. I think it's amazing. Not only is there the, the environmental benefit, but there's also a social impact as well. So having, you know, being able to keep those, you know, iconic Canadian landscapes intact. Also, you know, I spent actually three months in the United Kingdom on a young farmer exchange, thanks to junior farmers. And one of the things that I noticed uh, during my travels was the amount of animals out grazing and how that is part of their landscape. And so when you don't have that, you just sort of lose the feel of having those animals there. And uh, I do think there is that that social impact that we might not uh, that we might underestimate. Yeah, it would make oil paintings a lot more boring. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about Ducks Unlimited because I know that the beef industry has been doing some really interesting work out west with the Ducks Unlimited because out there with uh, the potholes that are, are there from glaciation, those are really good wetland nesting areas for ducks and those are often on uh, grazing land for cattle. Can you talk a little bit about how you've worked with Ducks Unlimited to make sure that those habitats for the ducks are not damaged by the grazing of cattle? Sure I mean certainly I can't speak from personal experience but I can certainly point to sort of some of the things that I see the industry is doing Um, and mostly uh, recently there was an article and a big announcement made by um, McDonald's Canada, Cargill, which is a processor of beef in Canada, and Ducks Unlimited to say, to announce that they're working in collaboration to work together to preserve these uh, these native lands. And certainly uh, McDonald's Canada has made a commitment through their sustainable beef initiative. It's really exciting to see these three three things together. And I do have friends that work closely with ducks and very carefully, again, going back to everything being properly managed and, and about timing, grazing their their cattle on, on lands that are owned by ducks unlimited. And it's key that the cattle are grazing during certain times and uh, not during critical times where the bird species or the ducks are nesting. So it's become a really fruitful partnership. And again, we have cattle coexisting with the natural environment and ducks part of their mandate is they want to see biodiversity and maintaining these wetlands and critical spaces so uh, it's really exciting to see, and I hope we see more of it uh, across uh, across the country. Now, I want to go back to you as a young woman in the beef industry, because when I was just thinking, and we were just talking about uh, the beef industry across Canada, I was thinking of the name of the uh, one of the organization, which is the Canadian Cattlemen Association, right? And men is, is prominent in the name, and you're not a man, and you've grown up in the beef industry. So let's talk a little bit about what that was like for you and how the industry is trying to deal with the needs of diverse population in the industry. This has been such an interesting debate. And there's the key thing with women is that not everyone has the same shared experience. For me, I would say that I come from a point of privilege. I actually was fortunate enough to grow up on a farm and uh, grow up into farming. But I think in order for us to remain relevant as an industry and to attract people, new people, whether that's women or people from other diverse groups, uh, we need to uh, take a really critical look 
at ourselves and how we project ourselves out into the world. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association, they're a 90-year-old organization, and uh, they actually have made an announcement recently about they're taking a a hard look at potentially rebranding or repositioning themselves. And I think that's very smart. And being a graduate of the Cattlemen Young Leaders Program, which is a mentorship program uh, that the Canadian Cattlemen's Association created about a decade ago, what we are seeing is that 60% of the graduates are women. And so when we talk about the future of agriculture and the future of this industry, it is a very sophisticated industry. It's very high tech. And, you know, we need more people like myself and others to, you know, see this industry grow and thrive and and be relevant. It strikes me that, you know, the industry right now is got a number of challenges. I'm thinking in terms of, of workforce, I'm thinking in terms of perception. How are you sort of tackling those issues and where do you see the industry being in, say, 10 years time? I think we've seen some organizations. I I point to some of the work that's happening here in Ontario with uh, Beef Farmers of Ontario, Grain Farmers of Ontario, where they're looking at diversity and inclusion and uh, you know, reaching out to their female farmer members and, you know, creating initiatives and programming uh, to support to support women. I mean, I think the the, the notion that <laughs> if you're a woman that you're just married to a farmer, that's that's your only role. I think the women that I know, the majority of them, they are the ones that are also actively farming alongside their spouses. And so I think really it's it's a discussion that's going to go on and it, there's lots of diverse opinions about it. But uh, my hope and is that, you know, in the future, uh, we uh, are able to retain a really smart and sophisticated workforce because that is our industry and uh, it's diverse from everything from primary producers like myself, all the way to, you know, truckers and the spin-off industries that support agriculture. Um, we need we need to attract those people. And the Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council, they've done extensive work in terms of looking at some of the labor um, gaps in the sector. And there is a realization that uh, we're in some serious trouble if we cannot attract new people in our industry. Um, and that really impacts uh, Canada as a whole and our ability to be food secure. Just speaking of food, you know, that, that one of the other pressures I see, and I touched on this at the very beginning of the interview, was, you know, people are moving towards plant-based diets. We're seeing companies like McDonald's, like Tim Hortons, offering uh, burgers that are made from plants, uh, sausages that are made from plants. There's a move towards growing meat in the lab. And is that putting a, a significant pressure? pressure on the industry right now? I mean, I don't necessarily have the stats to uh, back it up. I know, fr- you know, farmers get frustrated by it. Look, I mean, we're seeing a greater push for meatless diets or diets with like less meat. And I think a lot of that is because people want, they care about the environment, right? And they think that by eating less meat is going to help the environment. And, and farmers know that that's not necessarily the case. But I would also say is that going back, to agriculture being very sophisticated, very technologically advanced. Just because we're not eating meat doesn't mean that we're supporting agriculture, right? We look at the grasshopper farms. We have some grasshopper farms in Ontario emerging. We also have, you know, supporting the bean growers and some of their products are, you know, gaining some some market share. So I think I promote choice. I think it's good to have choice. I think it's good to have competition and let people choose. But I think my biggest beef, uh, no Mm. pun intended, (laughs) is the fact that, um, you know, the, for the folks that are choosing to eat less meat because they think they're helping the environment. I think that is the one thing that that's the one myth. And it's something that I'm always kind of, I'm sharing my life with people on social media and I have a lot of friends in uh, urban centers and in Toronto. And I had one of my friends, he actually went vegan for a year. I'm really big on, you know, we can tell people all the good things that we're doing, but I love being able to show people, you know, all the good work that we're doing. So I do make a conscious effort to share photos and videos of things that are happening on my farm or share really good things that my fellow farmers around the country are doing. And uh, I had this person, the same person reach out and say, 
you know, I, you know, seeing your post has made me feel really good about you know, I'm going to be, you know, he started eating beef again and started eating meat in moderation. He said it was because of you. He said, I feel good supporting the industry because I see your posts and I see the animals out on pasture and they love seeing that. And so that really made me feel good because sometimes you wonder if people are seeing your posts and you wonder if your non-agriculture friends are cheering for you or what they actually think, but it's amazing even people that may not like my posts or comments. It's amazing the people that you reach and how telling the story is also about showing. Well, thanks very much for sharing your wealth of experience with the beef industry as a a farmer, as a a female farmer, as a politician and uh, advocate for the beef industry. You know, it's, it's great to hear Um, somebody that's optimistic about the industry and somebody who can speak so well about it. So thanks very much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Wayne. That was Amanda Broadhagen, converting vegans one tweet at a time. A lot of us take hay for granted, but not Judy Silva. Judy grew up on the prairies tossing bales of hay high into her family's barn. She developed a deep love for its scent and for the wide variety of brome grasses, fescue, and timothy that go into the fragrant horse feed. I spoke with Judy about the complexity and the memory of hay. Judy, thanks so much for joining us. I was really touched by the elegiacal nature of the piece that you wrote in Harrismith about hay and more specifically about your youth when you were surrounded by hay and surrounded by horses and surrounded by pasture. Can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what that was like for you? My dad was a diesel mechanic, so he was thankfully because he could fix and build anything. You name it, he could do it, my stepdad. Um, So we had to get, you know, the tractor, everything was used, the Massey Ferguson tractor, the hay baler, the cedar, everything was used. We didn't have um, the luxury of being able to buy something that you can use to lift bales up into the loft of your barn. And it was just the three of us. And I'm like 11 years old when we're starting this process. I didn't realize how strong I really was until in my later years. So my mom would drive the tractor and the first truck we got was an old 1939 International and it was the old three on the tree standard. And so I had to learn to drive those old standard trucks when I was 11 years old and I would drive through the field and I would have to gauge it so that I could stop the truck where there was the most bales kind of and I would get out and my dad and me, we would go and get those bales and I would either be on the truck and he would throw them on the truck and I would stack them on the truck. And as I got older, I could go and I could pick up the bales and throw them on the truck. I could throw them about three, four high, three high, pretty good. My dad could throw them like five high, but I did most of the stacking. And then he would hop in the truck and we'd drive all the way back into the barnyard. And then we'd have to, we didn't have a hay elevator the first year, I think. So I don't know how he did it, but he would from the back of the truck, he would park the truck underneath the opening and he'd have to chuck those hay bales up into the hayloft. And then I'd have to stack them in the hayloft all by myself. And you could go about eight, nine high in the hayloft. I mean, you always want to do it on a hot day when the hay's dry and you get hay sticks to you everywhere. It gets, even if you're wearing a cap, it gets in your hair, it gets in your shirt, it gets everywhere. So, and we had to do that several times because we would get at least a thousand bales off. So if you can imagine a truck fitting 40 bales on the back of a truck, maybe, and then doing that every time for, you know, 800 to a thousand bales, that's a lot of trip. Yeah, that's what it was like. But, you know, those are my fondest memories. (laughs) It's a lot lot cheaper than going to a gym, like sort of a hay gym. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yes. I want to I want to talk about the contents of those bales because it's one of the other things in the piece that that surprised me as somebody who didn't grow up around horses and didn't grow up on a farm that you know when I think about hay or look at hay and stacked in a farmer's field and stuff I think well it's hay and I haven't really thought about what's in it but there's all sorts of different grasses there's timothy and orchard grass and fescue and stuff can you talk a little bit about the what goes into hay. 
So basically you have your brome and you have your alfalfa. The alfalfa containing um, nitrogen in most of the protein. Um, the brome grasses are different types of grasses basically, and they have similar nutrient value amongst them. Some have different textures and slightly different tastes. So textures, some are softer, some are a little bit harder. Some hay can have clover, but we typically avoid clover because there is a very dangerous clover that can actually kill a horse. So we never actually had clover in our hay. It really comes to the geographical area that you buy your hay from. Uh, certain grasses will grow better depending on your soil, your climate. So if you're more in a sandy loam and you, where we lived, um, it was basically all sand. There were certain grasses that didn't like, didn't grow very well. So we grew Timothy, grew well in the dry areas along with alfalfa. Alfalfa is pretty hardy. Um, it can grow pretty much anywhere um, as well. So um, that's kind of, it's dependent on kind of your geographical region on what will grow and what won't grow. And of course, the horses love alfalfa, but it's so rich that you have to be very careful. You don't overfeed. You cannot feed a horse pure alfalfa usually um, because it's so rich. It can do what's called founder them and it can affect their feet, uh, their hooves and ability to walk and stuff. Well, it really so, reminds me of sorry. It really reminds me of, when you're talking about blending. It's it's all and and the sort of uh, terroir of the of the hay. It's very similar to growing grapes and and blending grapes for a particular palate and particular audience. Yeah, the, I can see that perspective. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Right. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing your memory of hay and your uh, experience with hay. Uh, I very much appreciate the time you took. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. That was Judy Silva, a prairie girl and a sommelier of hay. So here we are at the end of this episode of Harris Smith Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to this podcast at Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast player. And please tell your friends and family. Got feedback? We'd love to hear it. You can email us at letters at harrismithmag.com. That URL, harrismithmag.com, is also where you can order subscriptions online. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on newsstands of selected stores across Canada. Until next time, for Harrismith Radio, I'm Wayne McPhail. And also, until next time, remember these four words. Make. Grow. Sustain. Share. Tune in for the next episode of Harrismith Radio.